The parable of the sower is found in Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4, where we just read, and Luke chapter 8. When you read the Gospels and you go through the New Testament, you know the Lord Jesus frequently used parables as a means of illustrating profound and divine truth. A parable is a teaching tool, and again, as I mentioned, one that Jesus used very often. Some of his parables were very short, ranging from just a single verse, like Matthew 13, 33, and some to a couple dozen verses, Luke 15, 11 through 32. I read, and I love this thought, it's been said that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And you might understand as you go through the parables in the Gospels to contain two distinct layers. On the surface, the parable was just an interesting story, one that was easily understood by the listeners and based on things within their own experience. But the parable also had a deeper meaning and illustrated a spiritual truth. And in Jesus' use of parables, the truth most commonly dealt with was the kingdom of heaven. And so for many times, for the great multitudes that gathered and heard him teach and preach, and also many times for just the disciples themselves, it was easy for them to miss. And so is the case with the parable of the sower found in Mark chapter 4. And so here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to go through this parable. We're going to do our best with the guide of the Holy Spirit to understand the story of what Jesus is teaching. And then we're going to close it out. And we're going to ask ourselves three simple questions this morning. Three questions that the Holy Spirit has been asking me and working in my heart. And I hope you would be, like I mentioned, you'll be challenged for those first two questions, but encouraged as we close it out. So let's look at Mark chapter 4 if we can. The parable of the sower concerns, as we just read, a sower who scatters seed. And the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, that this seed falls on four different types of ground. Now back in those days, in the Bible uh, culture in the Middle East there, sowing took place after the first rains had softened the ground. The farmer would walk along the furrows, which are those long, narrow uh, trenches that are made by the plows, at a constant uh, pace, and they would have a bag of seed and quite literally just take that bag of seed, put their hand in it, and scatter and throw the seed over the soil. And so this is the image that Jesus is painting to the disciples and those that are listening to him, the image of a sower scattering seeds. And again, Jesus is just brilliant in his storytelling because it's obviously very relatable to those that are listen, listening. Many farmers, many do this, so they know exactly what he's talking about. But Jesus says that the seed they scattered fell on four different types of ground. The first of the four grounds is found in verse 4. We just read a few moments ago. The wayside ground, or what some commentators refer to as the hard ground. The second of the four grounds, found in verses 5 through 6, Jesus says is the stony ground. The third of the four grounds, found in verse 7, is the thorny ground. And the last of the four grounds, found in verse 8, is the good ground. And so Jesus explains that the seed could not germinate on the wayside. It could not germinate or take root in the stony or the thorny ground. But on the good ground, it flourished. And so this is the story that he tells the multitudes that are gathered around him and the disciples. And stick with me here this morning. I try to put myself in the shoes of the disciples and those listening. And I'm sure they're thinking, oh, that's, that's a cool story, Jesus. But what on earth are you trying to tell us? What on earth are you teaching us well in verses 14 through 20 jesus doesn't just leave them on a cliffhanger he goes through and he explains look at verse 14 of mark chapter 4 he says the sower soweth the word so we see that the sower is the believer and the seed that is being sown is the word of god or the gospel message and so as a believer, we sow seed, we spread and scatter seed of the gospel. The soil that the seed falls on in the story, those four types of grounds, those four types of soil, they are the human heart. Illustrations and examples of the human heart. And we know that when the gospel seed is hit or lands on the heart of a human being, it must be prepared to receive the seed before the seed can take root and produce harvest. Now let's go through what do these grounds represent. And this is just by way of introduction. We're laying the foundation, so stick with me this morning. The wayside ground, Jesus tells us in verse 15. Let's read it. And these are they by the wayside, 
where the word is sown, but when they have heard it, Satan come immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So the wayside ground represents someone who is hardened by sin. He or she hears the gospel but does not understand the word, and they allow Satan just to pluck the message away very quickly, keeping their heart dull and preventing the word of God from making an impression. I read this quote when studying this wayside ground. It says, speaking to some people is like trying to grow wheat in the passing lane of the local expressway. And it's so true. You ever talk to someone like that, a friend or family, you try to witness to, try to give the gospel, and their heart is just hard to sin and to self. And nothing is taking root in their life. And this quote shows the essence of the wayside ground. Look at verse 16. He explains the stony ground. And these are like... And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony grounds, who when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And so the stony ground pictures a man who professes delight with the word of God. Oh, I believe that, and it's almost that emotional feeling. However, their heart is truly not changed, and we'll get to this in more detail in a moment. They're trying to live one foot in God's camp, one foot in the world's camp, and when trouble arises, their so-called faith just quickly disappears. The stony ground. Then he says, verse 18 and 19, the thorny ground. Let's look what he says. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. The thorny ground depicts one who seems to receive the word, but as Jesus said, their heart is full of riches and money and pleasures and lusts. And the things of this world take their time and attention away from the world, and they end up having no time for the things of God. And then he comes to that final good ground. Verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit. That is the key right there. Some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. You see, the good ground portrays the one who hears the gospel, they understand the gospel, they receive the gospel, and then they allow the word of God and the Holy Spirit to accomplish God's Jesus result in their life. And salvation's proof, don't miss that, according to Matthew and many other passages of scripture, we'll turn to one in a moment, is fruit. If you are truly saved, your life will be changed. If you are truly a believer of Jesus Christ, you will reproduce spiritual fruit in your life. The heart pictures the true believer because fruit, a changed life, is the evidence of salvation. The other three hearts or grounds produce no fruit. So we can conclude and we can debate about this, but this is where I err on my, on my opinion as I study the text of the scripture. We can conclude that the other three grounds belong to persons who have never truly been born again. Not all true believers are as equally productive. Don't miss that. So just because you're saying, well, I'm not doing this, this, and that, but not all believers are equally productive, but from every genuine Christian's life, there will be some evidence of spiritual fruit. And so now quickly this morning, I ask myself and all of us three simple questions. Three simple questions as we work through this text. The first two are going to be challenging, and then we're going to end with some encouraging words from Jesus. But here's my first question this morning. Which one are you? I want you to think about that. Which one are you? If I ask for a show of hands, I'm sure most would say they're the good ground, or at least they want to be the good ground. But I have to assume that in a crowd this size, that's simply not the case with everyone. My main goal, I make it no secret as your pastor and the pastor of this church, is to make sure, number one, you're a believer of Jesus Christ, to encourage you, to, to help you have a personal relationship with him, and then to encourage and teach you how you can become more like Christ every day. But I understand at the same time, it's not just that easy, unfortunately. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Jesus said, narrow is the way. It's not always easy. But some today, your heart is the wayside ground. And I want the Holy Spirit to work, and I want you to be honest, and not tune out the words that we're going to look at here. But some of you this morning are the wayside ground. You've heard the seed of the gospel here in church. You have a family member who's been praying for your salvation, but your heart is hard. You have a hard heart unreceptive to the word of God. 
You've bought into your flesh, to self-intellect, to philosophies of the world, and you've made the soil of your heart so hard that it's easy for the birds. And by the way, in that, in that story, what do the birds represent that come and snatch out the seed? The devil and his, his angels. And your heart is so hard that when the seed is scattered, it's so easy for the devil and, and the spiritual forces of this world to come and just to snatch away any idea of God and Jesus and the gospel that tries to penetrate your heart. In reality, you think, well, I can't surrender. I can't choose Jesus. I'm my own master. But the reality is everyone has a master. It's either God or it's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so some of us this morning... That's us, the wayside ground. But then I think there might be some others who, you're the stony ground. Your heart is shallow ground, like thin soil on a rock, very typical to Palestine in the day as Jesus describes it. There's no depth. And because there's no depth, nothing can be planted. I believe this is representative of an emotional hearer. The joyful accept God's word. Oh God, I want to go to heaven and I want God's blessing and I want health and success and prosperity. But they do not fully grasp the price that must be paid to be a follower of Jesus Christ. To be a genuine Christian. A lot of times there's great enthusiasm for several weeks and months and maybe even a year. But the minute persecution or affliction or trials come, the enthusiasm and the joy quickly disappear. They've made a decision based on emotion and not by faith in Jesus Christ. And so you see what soon happens. They fall out of church. There's no change in their life. And they continue to live their life based on emotion and feeling rather than Christ and faith and Bible principles. And so we see the wayside. We see the stony ground. And then some today are the thorny ground. This heart pictures the person who receives the word but does not truly repent. What does repent mean? It literally means to turn direction. You're going one way but to turn from that direction and to head another. They don't want to repent from their sin. They don't want to remove the weeds that are in their heart. This person has so many different kinds of seed growing in their heart, caught up in the world, a desire for riches and money and materials, a lust of things. And God's word has no room to grow because, as I mentioned before, they're trying to serve two masters. They want one foot in the camp of God, one foot in the camp of the world, and it simply cannot be done. Jesus said in Matthew, no man can serve two masters. They can't let go. They're caught up in self. They're caught up in the cares and the riches of this world. They're caught up in hurts, and they say, God, God can't really love me. God can't really help me. And you know what? That is a form of pride and flesh, and they can't let go. People who heard the gospel, but as the days go by, they're choked by the concerns and the pleasures of this world and this life. They have greedy and selfish inclinations. They bear no fruit because they live to satisfy their interests. And by the way, can I tell you this morning, it's a very, very empty and lonely place and way to live. So we see the thorny ground. And most today, I believe, as he ends, are the good ground. This heart pictures a true believer because fruit, a changed life, is the evidence of true salvation. Keep your finger in Matthew 4. We're going somewhere, but real quick, turn to 2 Corinthians, if you would. That's in the New Testament, uh, right after the Gospels. Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians. And I want you to look at this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17, we look at this verse in discipleship and through Bible studies. Maybe many of you know this, but I want you to see this, so I'm not just making this up. I want you to see the Word of God. That fruit is the evidence of a changed life. A changed life is the evidence of true salvation. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Paul teaches us this many times through his letters. Look what he says. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And you can turn back to Mark 4. People who hear, hear the word of God receive it with faith, with an honest and upright heart. They bear fruit even if they have to face difficulties of life. Now, by the way, this does not mean perfection. We all fall. We all fail. But God is there to help us back up again. It does mean someone whose life has completely 
changed. And that's what the good ground is. Someone whose life has totally changed for the better. Someone whose life has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't want to embarrass him this morning. There are many people here in our church that I believe are a representation of this. But as I was planning this and writing this out, I thought right away of Billy. Billy Beard, and he's here. And I don't want to embarrass Billy, but every Friday morning me and him meet and we go through discipleship. And I can just tell you without getting into detail, Billy is a changed man. That's not because of Pastor Zach. That's not because of New Heights Baptist Church. That is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you see the evidence of his salvation in fruit and in changes in his life and in a goal to become more like Jesus Christ. Someone whose life is completely changed. Now I ask you this morning, real quick as we go through this, which one are you? Is your heart hardened by the philosophies, philosophies of this world? Is it just a good feeling or emotion that when times get tough, you'll throw out? Are you too caught up in the things of this world, unwilling to repent of your sin, to turn from your ways and jump all in for God? Oh, my friend, do not leave this morning without settling and answering that question. Having no doubt that you are a saved believer. Having no doubt your heart is the good ground producing the fruit of Jesus Christ in your life. Not the faith of your wife. Not the faith of your husband. Not the faith of your children. Not the faith of Pastor Zach. But your faith. Is it yours? Is your heart the good ground? Has there been a time and place where you have truly repented of your sins? Where you have put your faith in Jesus Christ? Where you have taken him as your savior? Pastor, I've been coming for months. I've been coming for years. And man, that would be embarrassing to admit, to raise my hand and say, you know what? I'm not really sure I'm saved. No, no, no. No embarrassment here. We would rejoice with you if you made that decision. Knowing for sure a changed, not a perfect life is the evidence of salvation. So I ask you this and we're moving along. Two more questions. One, which one are you? Then I ask you this is by way of conviction and challenging and admonition this morning. What are you doing to sow the seed of the gospel? You say, Pastor, I know I'm a believer. I know I'm saved. I know Jesus Christ is my Savior and my life has been changed. Amen and amen. But can I ask you, who are you telling? John 15, 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. The seed cannot grow in the hearts of people if no one is sowing the seed. 28,000 people live in Newtown. 20,000 people live in Southbury. 19,000 people live in Monroe. 18,000 people live in Brookfield. Just shy of 1 million people live in Fairfield County. Just shy of 900,000 people live in New Haven County. Folks, we live in a mission field. We support missionaries and we send them all over the world and I'm all for a missions program and my goal in prayer is to take four more missionaries on financially this year and to help get the gospel to the world. But truly right here where we live, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few, as Jesus said. And my desire and prayer is that New Heights Baptist Church and the people who go here get a heart and a burden for souls. To share the good news and spread the good news of the gospel. Listen, we don't do the saving. We don't do the convicting. Jesus saves. The Holy Spirit convicts. But God, for some reason, in his infinite love and mercy, uses you and uses me as vessels and messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so many churches today, we just get comfortable where we're at. We're there for the lights. We're there for the shows. We're there to be entertained we're there for a feel-good message. I think of the stony ground where it's just all stirred up emotion. And what we need is true disciples. Never mind our cities and our counties. Can I ask you this? What about your family? Does your family know Christ? Now, I'm not saying open your Bible and preach at them and shove church down their throat. In fact, I would strongly advise against that. But I am saying spending time with God Praying for the salvation of your friends and family and members of our community and then asking God for the Holy Spirit boldness to hand them a gospel track. Hey, read this when you have a moment. I'm praying for you. And I got here this morning. I believe our great illustration of what it would be to scatter seed right here. Gospel tracks. Just to go to friends and family and to say, hey, can I leave this with you? Hey, can I, can I give this to you? Hey, to, to my family member, I've been praying for you. God has worked in my life. Can I just hand this to you? 
Hey, hey, the waiter or the waitress at the restaurant, can I leave this with you? Hey, the, the per, the, that lady who, who, who's, whose kids play sports with my kids, can I, can I give that to you? Hey, to my neighbor, can I give that to you? Hey, to my family member that I've been praying for, can I just leave this with you? Hey, God has changed my life. I'm not trying to preach at you or shove anything down your throat. But when you have a moment, could you just read these verses on the back? I'm praying for you. You know what you're doing? You're scattering seed. And some will fall on the thorny ground, the stony ground, the wayside ground. But there are some that will fall on the good ground. And a life will be changed. But that life will not be changed unless there's a messenger, unless there's someone willing to say, you know what? It's not just about me and my problems and my circumstances. And I'm so self-centered and we're so fixed on our own issues and so fixed on our own desires. But it takes a true disciple of Jesus Christ to say, you know what? I want to have a heart for others like Jesus Christ did. I want to have a heart for others. I want to have boldness to share the good news of the gospel. And by the way, you know where boldness comes from? This is, not, this is another message. We won't go down this trail, but spending time with Jesus. The New Testament says that they saw the, the Pharisees and the Romans saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they said they must, they're bold. They must have spent time with Jesus Christ. And when you spend time in the word, that boldness increases. You're challenging, and you're sharing the seed. And so I ask you these two questions by challenge this morning. What ground are you? What are you doing to sow the seed? And then I ask you this as we go through the rest of chapter 4, and I love this. Do you trust him? Not talking about salvation, but I want you to work, look at this. I find it very interesting in Mark chapter 4 that after the parable of the sower, Jesus then, you can go through the verses, he teaches his disciples to be a light in this dark world. A city lit on a hill, a candle stuck in a dark room. He teaches them to grow their faith, the grain of a mustard seed, and to have that faith to do things for God. And I'm sure after that, the disciples went away believing and encouraged and on fire and burdened to spread the, spread the seed and to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing because Jesus, in so many words, says, all right, boys, you're fired up. You got that. You're committed. Look at verse 35 of Mark chapter 4. And the same day, the Bible says. Not weeks gone by, not months, not the next day. The same day. I just got a picture. These disciples are fired up. They're committed. They want to be on the good ground. They want to be seed scatterers. They want to make a difference for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, Jesus says, all right, boys. When the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Look at verse 36. From a transformative sermon, from a spirit-filled service and lesson, and after immediately leaving that scene, where do the disciples find themselves? Look at verse 36. And when they had sent the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. Verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind. Transformative sermon, on fire for God, ready to be seed scatterers, ready to make a difference, decided that they're good ground, they're believers of Jesus Christ, and the same day, they find themselves in a ship in the middle of the ocean. And what happens? A raging storm hits. Say, Pastor, I know I'm a believer. I'm all in for God. I want to sow seed. I want to be used of God to reach souls. I, I want to become more like Jesus Christ. We make those decision, decisions. We take that step of faith. And you know what God does? And I'm not making this up. You're reading here for yourself. God tests our faith. A storm hits us and it rocks our world. We're on fire for God. God, we're pleasing you. God, we're trying to grow and become more like you. We're, we're in church. We're getting people saved. We're committed. We're making decisions. And then that storm just out of nowhere rocks your world, a storm of doubt. Is this really for me? Am I really getting this? We doubt. A storm of guilt. Satan whispers in your ear, you're trying to become like Christ and go to church. It's not going to work. Pastor Zach don't know your past and your stories and your mistakes. He sees you on Sunday, but he don't know what's really going on. A storm of sin, a storm of anxiety, a storm of worry, of fear, a financial struggle, of a health issue, of a wayward loved one. You fill in the blank, but the storm hits and our faith is put 
to the test. And listen to me, church. If New Heights Baptist Church is going to continue to grow and press on for Christ and be a light in a dark world and preach the truth of God's word and lift up the name of Christ, then you best believe we will be met with storms and spiritual opposition. But this morning we have Jesus Christ, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This morning we have a local New Testament church, a body of believers that loves each other and prays for each other and supports each other. And that's why it's, it's so important. And maybe you say, well, this, is, this isn't my fit. This church doesn't work for me. That's fine. I would encourage you, find a good local New Testament church that preaches the Bible and plug in. Your family needs it. Your marriage needs it. Your children need it. Make it a priority. And that storm hits can I say, listen to me, believer, individuals, if your family is going to continue to grow and press on for Christ, be a light in a dark world, become more like Christ, bear spiritual fruit, you will be met with oppositions and storms. We were in California this last week, and man, it's just an amazing week. God really worked and stirred my heart and challenged me. I learned a lot of nuts and bolts about the ministry and Ministry out there runs five, 6,000 people every Sunday, 90-acre campus, college, Christian school, just amazing facilities, amazing, amazing in California. And we went to sessions and workshops and just how we can do different things better and organize and reminded that, hey, it's not just the processes and methods, those are, the, those are important, but it's also about staying plugged into the Holy Spirit of God. He's the power source in all of this. It was challenging, it was convicting, it was stirring. And immediately upon coming home, it was as if just one thing after the other and the other and the other and the other. And I almost had a smirk because it's easy to get discouraged there, but also I was encouraged because it reminds me that God is doing something here and the devil is fighting. God wants to take our church to places. God wants to take your family to places. God wants to take you to places. And the devil is fighting. Spiritual warfare is real. And when those times come as a church, when those storm hits as an individual believer, we must ask ourselves this question. Do we trust him? Look at verse 38 of Mark chapter 4. We're winding down. And he, talking about Jesus, where was he when the storm hits? <laughs> He's in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. He's doing good. They awake him and they say unto him, Master, carest not thou that we, that we perish? Jesus, why are you sleeping? Do you even care that we're dying over here? How many times do we feel like that in our own lives? I feel like Jesus is a million miles away. Do you even care? Look at verses 39. And he arose... And rebuked the wind, and he said unto the sea three simple words, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Pastor Zach, I was on fire for God. My life was changed. I was bearing fruit. I was all in, and, and I still am all in, but, but I got to be honest I feel like my fire has started to die out a little bit. I'm not in my Bible like I should be. I'm not in prayer. It takes everything in me. It's a chore just to get to church. I've been hit with a storm of doubt, just doubting so many things. Fear, worry, questioning, a trial that's come that's just knocked me off my feet. My friend this morning, can I encourage you, don't let the enemy win. God is using that situation to test your faith and grow your faith. And in those times, can I encourage you to slow down, to breathe, to turn to God in prayer, to seek his face, to resist the devil. And you know what you will find? Jesus was right there in the boat with you the whole time. You read the text in the story for yourself. The disciples were looking out at the storm. God, where are you? Do you see the storm? The waves are coming and the lightning's flashing and the, and the waves are sinking us and they're all looking at the storm and the trial and the circumstance and their eyes are fixed on where they're at and not fixed on Jesus. And so I would encourage you, rather than looking at that fear, that storm that you feel has hit you while you're there on the boat and those waves are crashing, that lightning is flashing. That thunder is roaring. 
And you said, man, the storm has come out of nowhere. I was smooth sailing. I was on fire. But here's the storm. And it's so easy in our humanity, in our flesh, to look at the storm. Can I encourage you to stand there strong in the boat? And rather than looking at the storm and what's going on around you, fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. And you know what he's there to say? Peace, be still. Peace, I leave with you, he said in the New Testament. The God... Of peace. I love that word peace. <laughs> Christian, do you trust him? Turn your eyes to him. Get back to the basics. Denounce the fears and doubts in the name of Christ and let God grow your faith and draw you closer to him. And give your heart and mind the peace that passeth all understanding. Disciples were on fire, they were growing, and the storm hit. How will you respond to the storm? You've been in church for a year, for two years, for months now, and now the storms are starting to really hit. How are you going to respond? Can I encourage you? Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's got you. He's testing your faith. He's taking you, pardon the pun, to new heights in your spiritual life. So I ask you this morning as we conclude, three questions. What soil are you? What ground are you this morning? Are you truly a believer of Jesus Christ? Or are you just going through the motions? Do you remember that time and place where you bowed your head and you repented of your sin and you put your faith in Jesus? April 13th, 2007, I'll never forget it. I disciple with Billy, I mentioned him before, I think he has November 13th, 2023 in his Bible, the time he did it. Do you have a time and place where you put your faith in Jesus? Can I ask you this, are you sowing the seed of the gospel? Who are you telling? Do you have a burden for souls? And then I ask you, do you trust him? Are your eyes on Jesus Christ?